Happy holidays, everybody, and welcome to Cinematic Excrement. Today, we're going to step away from the Worst Picture Project, as I've already reviewed Saving Christmas and Surviving Christmas, and those are the only two Christmas movies that have ever been nominated for Worst Picture. <laughs> the only two. Instead, we're going to look at a movie that has actually been in my backlog for quite some time, and it seems its day has finally come. Four Christmases. Released in 2008 and directed by Seth Gordon, Four Christmases stars Vince Vaughn and Reese Witherspoon as Brad and Kate. Both come from divorced families that they do not get along with, and they are constantly looking for excuses to avoid spending time with them, especially around the holidays. I'm sure many people can relate to a story like that, but not so much to this specific story, judging by the 25% on Rotten Tomatoes. Far from the lowest rated movie I've reviewed on this show, but not great either. I suppose I should point out this movie was made in the midst of a Writers Guild strike, which is certainly not a good sign. Now, as far as I can tell, they did actually have a completed script, but they weren't able to make any changes. However, Star Trek was in a similar situation, and they still managed to churn out a decent movie. Sadly, this is not Star Trek, although it does have significantly fewer lens flares. We first meet Brad and Kate at a San Francisco bar where Brad attempts to hit on Kate but fails miserably because she finds him boring as hell. Brad does not take rejection well. Bitch, I'm talking to you. Whoa. Um, he seemed pretty mild-mannered a minute ago. Where did that come from? Well, you sure can talk the talk, you crazy little slut. But can you deliver the goodies? Yeah, Brad, I don't think this is going to help your chances, and never mind, they're getting it on. And she even takes him home. Well, this is where you live? This is where you live too, honey. Wait, they're actually a couple? That was a role play? You know, there was a time when this would have weirded me out, but in the many years since I started this show, I have seen some shit. As long as they're not hurting anyone and not doing anything that involves dryer lint, I'll allow it. Besides, there's weirder stuff that happens in this movie, like when they take dance lessons and another couple assumes they're getting married, which, for the record, they aren't. So, why are you taking dance classes? Ah, yes. Per California state law, you are not allowed to take dancing lessons unless you are engaged. Of course that's not true. What are you talking about, asshole? This entire conversation is weird. The other two couples are borderline offended by the fact that these two are perfectly happy without getting married. A man and woman in love with no interest in holy matrimony? This is a thing unheard of! Oh, did I also mention that they... DON'T WANT CHILDREN?! <laughs> whoa, 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 Personal space, personal space! Please, take 20% off and dial it back. Thank you. We are still in a pandemic. Keep your distance. I shouldn't have to spell this out, but there is absolutely nothing wrong with not wanting to get married or have children. And anyone looking down on Brad and Kate for not wanting those things is a douchebag. So it would be very easy to side with Brad and Kate in this situation if it weren't for their explanation for why they don't want marriage or kids. We don't want our relationship to turn into work. We just want to be together because we enjoy it, not because we have to, you know? No. I don't know. Are you somehow under the impression that long-term relationships don't require work unless marriage is involved? I have a feeling these obvious commitment issues you two have are going to come to a head in, oh, let's say, an hour's worth of this movie's runtime. Spoiler alert! Anyway, as I mentioned before, these two want absolutely nothing to do with their families because they are horrible, so they are planning to spend Christmas in Fiji. Oh god, is this another movie that's going to shame people for going on vacation for Christmas? Lots of people do that. I've done that. It's not weird. Get over it. But what's kind of weird is they didn't bother to tell their families that they were going to Fiji. Don't your families get upset? Not if you tell them you're doing charity work. Oh, I don't believe for one second that you two have ever done actual charity work. So they take a cab to the airport, which is... Crossing the Golden Gate Bridge? Hold the fucking phone. What? Okay, it's time for me to talk about something that you probably don't care about, but I live in the Bay Area, so I notice these things. So, what we have here is a map of the San Francisco Bay. Wait a minute. Sorry, that, uh, that was obviously the wrong map. Yeah, 
Uh, let, let's try this again. Hope this is the right one. There we go. This is actually a map of the San Francisco Bay Area, where we are lucky to have three major airports. The San Jose Airport, the Oakland Airport, and the San Francisco Airport which is technically not in San Francisco, but never mind. If you happen to live in San Francisco and are taking a cab to SFO, what the hell is wrong with you? Just take BART. It's cheaper than a cab ride and the train goes right into the terminal. But if you insist, the cab ride will simply take you down the 101 and you're there. If you're flying out of San Jose, just keep going down the 101 to the 87. You can't take BART to the San Jose airport because BART doesn't go there. At least, not yet. Maybe it will someday. Possibly if they get around to it. Not in my lifetime at the rate they're going, but I digress. Now you'll notice I have not mentioned any bridges thus far. That's because there aren't any involved if you're going to SFO or SJC. However, if you're going to Oakland, again, take BART, dummy. But if you must take a cab, you will indeed cross a bridge. But it's the Bay Bridge that takes you to Oakland and the greater East Bay area. Crossing the Golden Gate Bridge takes you away from all three airports up into North Bay. So what airport are they going to? Portland? I know if you're filming in the San Francisco Bay Area, you have to get your obligatory shot of the Golden Gate Bridge. It's the law, probably. But if your characters don't have a reason to be on the bridge, don't put them on the bridge! This concludes your geography lesson for today, boys and girls. Please poke your neighbor who has fallen asleep and let them know the silly movie review is about to resume. So Brad and Kate get to the San Francisco airport, somehow, and why the hell are they dressed for Fiji now? They're still in San Francisco in December. My God, they must be freezing. Unfortunately, all flights have been canceled due to heavy fog, which is entirely plausible in San Francisco, so they're stuck here until tomorrow. The ticket agent offers to put them in the Radisson for the night, which prompts Brad to get snippy because apparently he's an entitled douche. Put me up at the Radisson. That's great, honey, did you hear that? No, no, that's terrific. Would it be possible to take us out to Sizzler and get us McDonald's as a dessert? Will you shut up? What do you expect Ralphie to do? Blow the fog away? You live in San Francisco. You know how this works. But as Brad demands to speak to the weather's manager, a Channel 5 reporter who is apparently broadcasting live waltzes up to them to ask about their travel plans, which seems kind of rude, and also unlikely. Why would they be doing a live report for this on Christmas morning? I'm sure all the local networks have someone on call in case the big earthquake hits or something, but heavy fog? In the Bay Area, we have a word for that. Tuesday. Hardly seems worth dragging a crew out of bed on Christmas Day to cover this. And somehow, all of their families were watching this exact same news report and know they're not going anywhere until tomorrow. This would be a great time for Brad and Kate to come clean and finally admit they don't feel comfortable spending the holidays with their families, but then we wouldn't have a movie. They could also come up with another excuse to not spend time with their families. Brad could simply tell his family, Oh, sorry, we already made plans to spend the day with Kate's family. And Kate could say the same about Brad's family. And then they just hide out in the Radisson for the day. They don't think of this because they're stupid. Since they both have divorced parents, they now have four families to visit in one day. Four Christmases, if you will. And it is remarkable how we see very little fog in their travels, even though it's thick enough to ground all flights, and how none of these locations appear to be anywhere in the San Francisco Bay Area, even though that's allegedly where they are supposed to be. And all of these driving scenes are on rural highways. We have pretty densely packed cities here. How are there no city driving shots? Then again, this movie thinks the San Francisco airport is right next to the Golden Gate Bridge, so we are clearly in some kind of parallel universe. This is the point where the movie attempts to mine comedy from the holiday family awkwardness. Attempts is the key word here. The first stop is Brad's father's house, where he is verbally abused by his father, played by Robert Duvall, and physically abused by his wannabe cage fighter brothers, played by John Favreau and country musician Tim McGraw. And if you asked me to picture the MCU's Happy Hogan as some kind of asshole backyard wrestler, never in a million years would I be able to conjure up that image. Which is why I'm surprised how well Favreau was pulling off that look. Kudos to the hair and makeup department. And on the advice of his girlfriend, Brad tries to stand up to his brothers and set some boundaries, letting them know he is not okay with their constant beatdowns. And this actually turns into a very touching moment where they apologize and they learn to respect. I'm just kidding. They beat his ass some more. I cannot begin to tell you how much this is not funny. 
This is disturbing. They're trying to murder the poor guy and the father just sits back and laughs. Every single member of this family should be in jail. And the awkwardness continues when Brad gets his nephews an Xbox, despite there apparently being a $10 limit on gifts, which Brad was unaware of. Maybe someone's family didn't tell him that there was a $10 spending cap. Maybe if you came home more than once a decade, you know crap like okay, that. Guys. Or maybe you could have just told him over the phone that there was a spending cap. I know you know how phones work because you called him after you saw him on the news. Then they move on to Kate's mom, played by Mary Steenburgen, who remarried a pastor, played by Dwight Yoakam, and her sister Courtney, played by Kristen Chenoweth. Wow, there are people in this movie. And Kate warns Brad their house is a bit of a cougar den. This, of course, means every one of Kate's female relatives hits on Brad. Um... Comedy? Awkward, but not nearly as awkward as when they sit down and share their Christmas wishes with the family. I could increase the frequency with which I pleasure milled with my hand and with my mouth. Merry Christmas! And there's a bit where we learn Kate had a bad experience in a bounce house when she was little. And then she has to venture into a bounce house in her mom's backyard and starts losing her mind like a war vet having flashbacks. This is ridiculous on paper because it's a bounce house. No amount of ominous music can make that threatening. On the other hand, these kids are horrible little shits and actually start beating the ever-loving hell out of her. I'm starting to detect a theme in this movie. Nobody respects boundaries. Then they visit Brad's hippie mother, played by Sissy Spacek. And at this point, I'm realizing just how much this movie does not deserve its cast. And we learn Brad's best friend from childhood is now shacking up with his mom. Please note you will find your sick bags in the seat pocket in front of you. I never had a sexual thought about your mom until I was 30. If I had a nickel. And throughout all of this holiday humbug, Brad and Kate start to question their relationship as they come to realize there's a lot they don't know about each other. This might have been poignant if what they didn't know about each other actually meant anything. For example, did you know Brad's birth name was actually Orlando because he and his brothers were named after the city where they were conceived? I'm sure you didn't need to know that, but it's too late now and I apologize for nothing. And did you know Kate used to be <gasps> fat? Hey, no, we talked about this. But does any of this information really matter? Well, let's take a look at the give a shitometer. Um. Is it stuck or? Spider Man No Way Home. Ah, okay. Uh, Mark Meadows indicted for contempt of Congress. Yeah, that, that tracks. Uh, Omicron variant. Oh, we are so screwed. Um, Devin Booker returns from injury. Ah, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we asked a famous director what he thinks of superhero movies. And there we go. Yeah, it's working. This information is so trivial, it's laughable. So what if Brad no longer goes by his birth name? So what if Kate was fat as a child? Does it matter? Does it have any actual effect on their relationship? It shouldn't. How can you really appreciate someone for who they are until you really know them? Don't try to have a message now, movie. You've already ruined it. If that wasn't enough, further bullshit conflict is created as Kate is apparently having second thoughts about whether she wants to get married and have kids. And I find this very sudden change of heart pretty sus, considering both their parents are divorced and her primary interaction with kids so far has been the horrible little shits in the bounce house and... this. I do not believe for one second that anyone would go through what Brad and Kate experienced and come out the other end wanting marriage and children. In fact, I'm pretty sure this movie could be classified as a form of birth control. Ultimately, Brad and Kate decide to go their separate ways, and Kate visits the last of the four parents alone, her father, played by John Voight. This is the parent we spend the least amount of time with, likely because he's the only halfway decent parent of the bunch, and thus presents little opportunity for comedy. And it's ironic that he's the only well-adjusted parent, considering he's, well, John Voight. He also tries to give this movie a message by saying he used to lie to avoid spending time with his family, and he wishes he could get that time back. And that might be a good message if every family in this movie weren't a complete mess. Look, family is important, especially around the holidays, and I have been very fortunate to have a good, loving family, and I'm happy to spend time with them during Christmas. Well, except for last year, but that, that doesn't count. 
However, I recognize that not everyone is in the same boat. And if you have a family that is abusive and hurtful and toxic and just makes your life a living hell, there is nothing wrong with cutting them out of your life. You are not obligated to spend time with them just because it's Christmas or for any reason. If they are genuinely horrible people, fuck them. Life is way too short to subject yourself to that shit. But of course, Brad has a change of heart as well, and they make up, and one year later, they got a baby. And they just happened to have the first baby of the new year, prompting a news crew to barge into their hospital room for an interview, which I'm pretty sure no hospital would allow them to do. And this gives us one last awkward moment where we learn they never even told their families they were expecting. Hang on. While I don't necessarily fully agree with this movie's message, wasn't the point that you're supposed to spend time with your family no matter how messy they can be? And then they went and had a baby and didn't tell anyone? I'm getting some mixed messages here, movie. Did they also get married and not say anything? Because honestly, I wouldn't be shocked. Four Christmases is quite a chore to get through. Poor knowledge of Bay Area geography aside, it's not funny, it's surprisingly misanthropic for a movie about family togetherness, which makes that message ring hollow, it has no likable characters, the talent of its cast is wasted, this movie has five Oscar-winning actors, not to mention several talented singers who somehow don't do any singing, and the two leads have no chemistry at all. The only time I found their relationship believable was when they were arguing, which actually makes sense as reportedly Witherspoon and Vaughn did not get along behind the scenes at all due to their contrasting personalities. Reese generally likes to be prepared and wanted to block out scenes and rehearse lines ahead of time, and Vince is more a go-with-the-flow type and prefers ad-libbing whenever possible. Things apparently got so heated that a sex scene between the two was cut as Witherspoon flat out refused to do it. When it came time to promote the movie, Vaughn conveniently had a scheduling conflict and had to back out of the press tour, leaving Witherspoon to handle the PR work all alone. He didn't even show up for the premiere. If I didn't know any better, I'd swear he knew what was coming and found a way out. Pussy. Critical reception was not great, though it could have been worse, and it managed to pull in $160 million at the box office, double its production budget. So it was hardly a flop, and it escaped the ire of the Razzies, which I understand considering this movie came out in 2008, which we talked about in the last episode. I mean, if Twilight wasn't bad enough to be nominated for Worst Picture, Four Christmases certainly wasn't. It still sucks, though. I don't think I can recommend this movie because I'm not really sure who it's for. I suppose it was meant to be for people who hate visiting their families during the holidays, and if nothing else, you might get some comfort in the fact that, as bad as your family might be, at least they're not as bad as the families in this movie. Unless they are that bad, in which case I'm so sorry. But even so, I don't think it's worth watching because it's simply not funny. And a comedy that is not funny serves no purpose. Speaking of things that serve no purpose, next year we will resume the Worst Picture Project. Until then, I am the Smeghead, and I wish you all a happy and hopefully healthy holiday season. I'm sorry, I love you. You gotta get out of here. Dad. I can't read. <laughs>